let me know and then I'll begin. Do you recommend ISAF? Do I recommend ISAF? Jesus does. I can show you in the Bible where he does. I don't really recommend anything, but Jesus does. <laughs> Thank you, Norma. All right, so, so far we've been going through the first angel's message, and I know the screen says part five, but we're actually done part six now because uh, Pastor got a little long-winded during one particular meeting, um, but we're, we're, we're getting through it. But let's cover a little bit, let's review a little bit of what we learned because we missed last week. I was sick. Thank you for your patience. Um, I am feeling better, but when I take deep breaths, sometimes I cough, so bear with me if that happens. So in the first angel, we learn uh, the message was preaching the everlasting gospel to those who dwell on the earth. The message is to fear God and give God glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made. Now, <coughs> excuse me, most of the world has rejected the pure truth of the first angel's message, and as a result, there is downgrading or degrading of the truth. In other words, the message is to go to those who dwell on the earth. Most of the earth has rejected this message, um, but they have set up their own form of, of worship, their own form of, of, um, of religion. Thank you. And, and, and in that, they've changed the truth, and they've brought God to their level instead of allowing God to bring, them, bring us to his level. And as a result, we have downgraded um, and degraded the truth. So the second angel, or Babylon, is a direct result of a rejection of preaching of the true gospel and the symbol of creation, the Sabbath. So having said that, let's move on to the second angel. Uh, so the second angel, there's no loud voice. The message is about Babylon, that Babylon has fallen. It talks about the wine of fornication. It talks about getting God's wrath. And it's the message of death versus <coughs> excuse me, preservation of self. So, <coughs> sorry. The second angel. Why isn't the second angel's message given with a loud voice? This is a question I always want you to have in your, in your thought process. And uh, the three angels' messages represent the main message that God has given his last day people to preach. They cover three final end time periods of church history. So very, very important points of information there, and we're going to talk about these things tonight. So the first angel, <coughs> sorry, I think it'll work itself out here pretty quick, and I should stop that. Um, so the first angel's message began to preach its message around 1844, right? So this, this God raises up this movement. They're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. They're on fire for God, and they're doing anything and everything that he asks them to do. And they are proclaiming this message extremely loudly and telling people to get ready because God is coming, right? Um, so that started around 1844. And then the third angel's message is present-day truth during the time of the latter reign, or mark of the beast. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Are we in the time or in the time just before the mark of the beast? I guess you can make the argument that we're in the time just before the mark of the beast, but um, are we in the time of the mark of the beast? The answer is no. There's no mark of the beast being enforced at this time, right? If there was, we'd all know it because it says that when the mark of the beast is enforced, you won't be able to buy or sell unless you take that mark, right? And so that's not taking place now. So we know that that isn't quite happening yet. And do we see, um, <coughs> do we see um, a, a mass spiritual revival that we saw in 1844 taking place in our churches? Okay, but do we see it right now? No. So we know that that tells us that we are not living in the time of the three angels' message yet. So that tells us then what time period the second angels is. So um, when is the time period of the second angel? If it's not in the 1844, and it's not in, during the time of the third angel, the mark of the beast, we're not in either of those times, what time is the second angel's message? Right now, right? Okay, thank you. What's that? In 29? Like 1529? 1629? 1629? Okay, well, we'll look at the second angels tonight. All right, so the first angel's message corresponds to the church of Philly, and if that's true, when is the time frame of the second angel's message? It is what we were praying for, Laodicean, right? Now, we're going to show you that tonight in this presentation. So, going back to doing a little review, 
the progression of the first angel's message, gospel of Jesus is preached, which leads to fear, respect, love towards God, and then fearing or reverencing God is a result of accepting the everlasting gospel. We've learned that that is called justification when a, when a sinner uh, learns to, to love God, to fear God, to respect God and they give their lives to Jesus, and they ask Jesus into their heart, that's justification. He comes in and he says that you are just as if you'd never sinned now because my son has taken your place. And then when we give God glory or keeping his law as a result of fearing God, that is sanctification. So as we love God and we say, God, thank you for changing me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Now I want to give back to you. And we start following God and keeping his commandments, that's sanctification, right? And then gospel, fearing God, equals giving him glory, because when we are keeping the law of God, when we are in harmony with God, we are bringing him glory, right? And we are also a much better witness. So the problem is the church at large has rejected the second half of the message, or the second half of the giving God glory part right? Now, remember, we talked about giving God glory, and that is keeping His law, right? Now, I'm not talking about um, just the Seventh-day Adventist church, although we could make arguments for that on an individual level if we wanted to, but I'm talking about the church, the Christian world as a whole, has rejected the law of God, all right? And so, we mostly preach about God's love, but reject the part about Jesus being Lord. We, the church as a whole, reject the law, particularly the Sabbath, and as a result, Babylon forms and was here to stay when the church rejected the Protestant Reformation. So what happens when we only focus on one part of the gospel? Now, I'm, I'm losing it a little bit, so help me read. <coughs> Sorry. It is true, you guys reading with me? It is true that spiritualism is now changing its form. So what is changing its form? Okay, it's on the screen right there, and it's red, right? Right here, okay? It is true that spiritualism is now changing its form. What is changing its form? Spiritualism. What is spiritualism? I'm going to give you a new definition in this quote, but your understanding of spiritualism, what is it? Satanic worship, okay. Um, witchcraft, Right? Uh, seances, things like that, right? Spiritualism, right? It is going to the spirit world to get information. Are you guys with me? Okay. So it is true that spiritualism is now changing its form and veiling some of its more objectionable features and is assuming a Christian guise. What kind of guise? <coughs> Christian guise. But its utterance from the platform and the press have been before the public for many years. And in these, its real character stands revealed. These teachings cannot be denied or hidden, even in its present form, so far from being more worthy of toleration than formerly, it is really a more dangerous, so now spiritualism is more dangerous than before because a more subtle deception. While it formerly denounced Christ in the Bible, it now professes to accept So before, spiritualism just outright denied Christ. It outright denied the Bible. But now it's taken on a more dangerous form. Why? Because now it claims to accept Christ and the Bible. Let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. But the Bible, even though now it's claiming to accept both, but now, but the Bible is interpreted in a manner that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart. While its solemn and vital truths are made of no effect, love is dwelt upon as the chief attribute of God, but it is degraded to a weak sentimentalism, making little distinction between good and evil. <laughs> God's justice, his denunciations of sin, the requirements of his holy law, are all kept out of sight. The people are taught to regard the Decalogue as a dead letter. The Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. Pleasing, bewitching fables captivate the senses and lead men to reject the Bible as the foundation of their faith. Christ is as truly denied as before, but Satan has so blinded the eyes of the people that the deception is not discerned. So, brothers and sisters, that means then that if we are preaching the love of God, 
without teaching the law of God and telling people they have a responsibility to keep the law of God. And we're only focusing on love of God. We are practicing spiritualism. It's spiritualism. Now, no one is making the argument that God is not love. God is love, right? But let me ask you a question. How would you feel as a child, so let's say you're four or five years old, how would you feel as a child if your mom or dad took you to the park to play with all the other kids? And some mean, rough, adult male came up and started hitting you for no reason. And while this was happening, your parents did nothing. They didn't say stop. They didn't come over and try to help. They just sat there and watched the whole thing and never said a word about it. How would you feel about your parents? How would you feel? You certainly wouldn't think that that was love, would you? No, you would think that your parents didn't love you at all. Imagine if you were an adult watching that and you saw somebody hitting and attacking these kids and the parents sitting right there and not doing or saying anything. How would you feel about that? You would think that there was something wrong with them, that they didn't love. Brothers and sisters, love delivers justice because it's not love if there's no justice. Are you with me? We all cry. We all demand justice. Why? Because when we've been wronged, we want somebody to make it right. And God says that someday I am going to set every case right. And in the meantime, I have provided a way of, of relief. I have provided a way out for everybody who wants it through my son who died on the cross. Amen? That is God's love. But he says, while I will love the sinner, while I will give mercy and pardon and grace to the sinner, freely whoever comes to take it, I will in no wise by any means clear the guilty. They will stand for their actions. They'll either let Jesus take their cup of indignation or they'll drink it themselves. Are you with me? If we just preach that God is love and there is no duty to being a Christian, we are preaching spiritualism. And nobody wins. Nobody wins. So let's look at the second angel's message with that in mind. There's a lot going on here, so what are the high points? Go to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8 tonight. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. Revelation 14, verse 8. This is the second angel's message. This is the, the second angel of the three angels' message, and this is what the second angel's message says to us. Revelation 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. <coughs> that is the message. Now let's look at the high points of it. The second angel talks about Babylon, is fallen, is fallen, that great city, wine of wrath, and her fornication. Now let's go through each one of these together. What is Babylon, and where do we see Babylon used in the Bible? To understand why this angel is not loud, we need to understand what it's talking about, and that will explain to us why it's not loud. Are you guys with me? So if you read the three angels' message, you'll see the first angel cries with a loud voice, and the third angel cries with a loud voice, but the second angel does not. And to understand why the angel is not loud, we need to understand the message that it's telling us. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right? So what is Babylon, and where else do we see Babylon used in the Bible? The symbol of Babylon in Revelation 14, 17, and 18 is rooted in the, whole, uh, rooted in the historical Babylon, which began in Genesis 11, and later developed... Um, into a major world empire during the time of Daniel. So let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 9, verses 13 through 17. I want to show you something very important. Genesis chapter 9, verses 13 through 17. <coughs> All 
All right, so you guys know what's taking place in Genesis chapter 9, right? Noah has been told to build an ark in Genesis chapter 6 because God's going to destroy the world. And then the, the flood comes, he destroys the world, they get off the ark and they make a sacrifice to God. And um, this is his response in Genesis chapter 19, or Genesis chapter 9, verses 13 through 17. <coughs> I do set my bow in the cloud. So this is God talking. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. So who is this covenant between? Between everything. Anything that lives, this is in this covenant. Are you guys with me? So is God talking to just Noah in this message? Is he talking to just Noah and his sons in this message? Is he talking to just Noah, his sons, and their wives in this message? No, he's talking about how much of humanity? All of humanity. Is he talking about how much of the living creatures? All of it. So he says that this is a covenant for everyone. Are you all with me? Very important to understand this. All right, let's move on. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all the flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is gone on the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the, to covenant, the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So God says, listen, I've destroyed the world. I want you to know that I'm not going to do that with water ever again. Here's a bow so that you can look on it and you can be reminded of it. And I'm making a covenant between the whole universe that I will never destroy this world with water again. Are you guys with me? All right. So it's interesting to me from Genesis to Revelation, Babylon is characterized as rebellion. Now, I know that we usually associate it with confusion. I'm going to explain to you why it's associated with confusion. But the root of the confusion is through rebellion. All right? The source of all confusion is rebellion against God. Are you guys with me? If we rebel against God, it leads us to a state of confusion. All right? So here we see that the rebellion led Babylon into confusion. Let's look at this. Genesis 11 verses 1 through 3. Actually, let's, let's skip this, and let's go to Genesis 9, verse 1 first, okay? Genesis verse nine, chapter 9 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1. After Noah has led out the ark, God says to him, and God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, do what? Be fruitful and multiply and do what? replenish the earth, fill the earth. What is the command to God? I mean, the command to humanity from God. And fill the what? The earth. Now, let me ask you a question. If I set up camp in Mayo, all right, if, if, if all humanity was just in Mayo, Michigan, it'd be a little bigger, I can tell you that. Would we be fulfilling the command to replenish the earth? Why? Okay. Very good. Go to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. God gives the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the whole earth, replenish the whole earth, go inhabit the whole earth. And what happens in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 3? Genesis 11, verse 1, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and there they dwelt. So did they start to do what God asked them to do? It says that they journeyed from the what? From the east. So did they start to replenish the earth? Did they start to fill out? Yes. But then they did what? They congregated. Why? Because they got tired of that nomadic lifestyle, didn't they? They said, I don't want to move any further, God. I don't want to go any further with you. I'm going to stay where I've come to. Brothers and sisters, we're going to talk about this, but I'm going to drop the seed right now. Many of us, when we're called, are willing to follow God to a certain point. And then we stop. But we stop before God's asked us to stop. <coughs> God asks us. To follow him fully. He asks us to surrender all. He says, you need to continue on this journey and go where I tell you to go. Don't stop part way. 
because my plan is a journey all the way. Are you guys with me? <coughs> all right, verse 3. And they said one to another, Go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. <coughs> I'm really sorry. Is there any way that, Fran, can you go get me some water? Or Carla, maybe? Thank you. <coughs> I'm really sorry. I'm getting over this cold. And I thought I'd have more energy tonight. But we'll get through it. It's just going to take a second. Ah. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Excuse me. Sorry if you're watching online. This is very disruptive. I apologize. Uh. What? Remorex? Right. Go to Genesis 11, chapter, or, or chapter 11, and verse 4. Okay? So we can see <coughs> that when Babylon enters the scene, they enter in in rebellion. So God told them to replenish and fill the whole earth. And in verse 4, it says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Thank you. I got two water. All right. So they were told to go and replenish the earth. And what did they do? They went as far as they were willing to go. And they stopped there and they said, we're not going to follow God's command anymore. In fact, we're going to make a what? A name for ourselves. We're going to make a city. And what are they going to do to make sure they don't have to follow God? Well, that's right. We're going to build a tower so big that God can't drown us. God can't destroy the earth, right? So in other words, we're going to take all of our talents, we're going to take all of our energy, we're going to take all the gifts that God's given us, and we're going to use them to not follow him. Are you guys with me? This is what God is seeing from his seat up in heaven. He's watching down with his spectacles. I don't know if God has spectacles, but anyways, he's watching down on the earth, and he's seeing this scene play out, and he's like, listen, I told you to multiply, and all you guys are doing is fighting against me as much as you possibly can. He says... He says, let us go down and confound their language. So according to what we read in Genesis 9-1, God's plan was for them to go to the whole earth. They wanted to make a name for themselves and not for God, and they did make a name for themselves. In verse 9, what is that name? Therefore is the name of it called what? Babel or confusion. Confusion. What led to the confusion? Confusion rebelling against God. Rebelling against God. In the second angel's message, notice that God is very definitive about the fall of Babylon. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. God says, Babylon has fallen. It has fallen. He repeats himself. John is taking the fall of Babylon from two Old Testament sources here. The Old Testament prophets predict the fall of Babylon. Isaiah 21, 9, then he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And in Jeremiah 51, 8, again, Jeremiah says, Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Wail for her. But in time, Babylon doesn't actually fall until Revelation 18. Now, I'm going to take this moment to shamelessly plug myself. After we get through the three angels' message, if you can continue coming on Tuesday nights at the same time, we are going to finish going through Revelation verse by verse. All right? We've already gotten up to Revelation 14. We're going through the three angels' message. It's a, kind of like a, a, a series inside a series, if you will. And then we're going to finish Revelation verse by verse, and we'll eventually get to Revelation 18, and I'll show you that. But 
end time Babylon doesn't actually fall until Revelation 18. So when the fall of apocalyptic Babylon is dedicate, uh, declared, it's declared proleptically. Does anybody know what that means? Proleptically. It means to say that something has happened before it actually happens. For instance, God told Adam and Eve when they eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what will happen to them? They will die. Did they die that day? No, but that action killed them because they started the process of death and eventually they died, right? Anybody ever seen a movie where somebody's walking down death row and they're taking that last walk? What do they call that? What do they call the person walking? <coughs> That's right, dead man walking. It's because the prison guards are announcing to the rest of the prison that this man is not going to be seen anymore. He's going to die. He's literally dead already, walking, okay? So that's what prolepsis is. Um, so let's move on. In the second angel's message, notice that Babylon is called a she, and she is called that what? That great city. And another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that what? Great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, this is not God being a sexist and attacking women or making fun of them. He's doing something very purposely here. Revelation is a book filled with comparisons and contrasts. <coughs> we can see the most important to God. We can see what is most important to God in the book of Revelation by what Satan counterfeits. Are you guys with me? So let's look at that. In chapter 12, we see this woman right here. Right here, we see this woman, chapter 12. But in chapter 17, we see this woman. One is pure, and the other is impure. <coughs> we hear about this city in Revelation 21. What city is this? What's it called? New Jerusalem, right? And then we hear about this city in the Old Testament and in Genesis and in Revelation 14. What is this city called? That's Babylon, right? That's a picture of Babylon. Okay. Now notice that both are square, and Babylon is Satan's version of heaven. It's his bride. Now we're going to talk about that in a couple nights too, or a couple weeks from now. But the new Jerusalem is God's heaven and his bride. So, Revel, I'm sorry, in, in Revelation 16, 13 through 14, we see these three unclean spirits coming out of the dragon's mouth. We know that this is the false trinity, right? And they have a message, and their message is the counterfeit to the three angels' message. Now, don't worry. I promise you that I'm going to explain all this stuff in more detail, but just bear with me if this is new information. So, just as God sent the three angels to do their work, Satan sends these three spirits to do theirs. So we have it right here. Satan is seeking to replace the thing that God holds most dear. Now let's go back to the woman and see what Satan is doing through Babylon. Revelation 17, 1 through 2. Please turn there with me. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 through 2. Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. What does this verse remind you of? Revelation 14, 8. Babylon, Babylon is fallen, for she has made the nations drunk with the wine of her what? Fornication. Very good. So let's notice the similarities between these two passages. Revelation 14, 8, Babylon is fallen. She's caused all nations to come after her. It's a she. She's making them drunk, and she commits fornication. Revelation 17, 2, Babylon is judged. All the kings and inhabitants of the earth come to her. Um, it's a her. She's got everybody drunk, and she commits fornication. So it's very clear that this woman in Revelation chapter 17 is the same Babylon that's talked about in Revelation 14. Are you guys with me? All right. So let's get a description of this woman then. 
This is all leading us somewhere. <coughs> Let's get a description of this woman. Revelation 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast, having a, a full um, of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten crowns, ten horns, sorry. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness in her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So let's see what we've seen so far. The impure woman equals an impure church. If you guys were to look up 2 Corinthians 11, 12, 2, you will see that God's bride, his church, is called his bride, or the chaste virgin. And so we know that in Bible prophecy, a woman represents a church. So if you're a pure woman, you'd be a pure church. And if you're an impure woman, you're a what? Impure church. Very good. Water equals multitudes of people, Revelation 17, 15. Fornication equals policy, um, instead of trust, Revelation 21, 9 through 10. Kings of the earth equal political leaders. Wine equals false doctrine. That's Luke 5, 37. Drunk equals deceived by false doctrine. Beast equals kingdoms, according to Daniel 7, 23. If you guys, if I'm going too fast and you want to look at this later, just come and talk to me and I'll explain it to you. Um, maybe I can email you the slide. Women riding the beast equals church plus state is combined, and this false church is in control, and names of blasphemy equals church is playing God. Now, there's a few other things that we need to deal with before we move forward, so um, let's get to those. And I promise that by the time we get all this done, it's going to make sense, okay? I'm going to a point, I just have to get there. Revelation 17, 4, notice the attire of the woman. The woman was arrayed in what colors? Purple, scarlet, adorned with what? Precious stones and pearls, right? All right. Where else do we see someone dressed in a similar way? Where else do we see someone dressed in a similar way? Who is this woman impersonating? I want to say it this way. You're right. But this woman is not impersonating the papacy because this woman is the papacy. So who is this woman impersonating? Do I have this slide up here? I do. All right. It has something to do with... Go to... It has nothing to do with the Statue of Liberty. Go to Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28. Exodus 28, we are going to see what the priests in the Old Testament used to wear. Exodus 28. Exodus 28, 4 through 8. This is talking about the clothing that Aaron and his sons are supposed to wear, that the high priest and the priest that served God in his temple, in his tabernacle, would wear. Let's look at this. Exodus 28, verses 4 through 8. Verse 4, And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe, an embroidered coat, a miter and a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, and they shall make an ephod of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet, and fine twine linen with cunning work. It shall have two shoulder pieces. They are joined at the two edges, therefore, and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod, which is upon it, shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen. And thou shalt take two onyx stones and grave them in the names of the children of Israel. Now, I'm going to pause right there, and you guys understand this as well, too. The priest was just to wear a what on his chest? The ephod, but he also had the breastplate. What is the breastplate? Do you guys remember what the breastplate is? It had how many precious gems? Twelve representing what? 
the 12 tribes of Israel, and they had 12 different stones, the ones that you see in Revelation 21 talked about, building the building of the New Jerusalem and the walls of it, okay? So what does the priest wear that this woman is not wearing? Not the breastplate. Sorry, I, I brought attention to that at the wrong time. I apologize for that, but I'm not all there tonight. What color does the priest wear that this woman is not wearing? Blue. Why is that significant? <coughs> Numbers 15, 38 through 39. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the what? And do them that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined. What does blue represent? The law of God. What color is this woman, this impure woman, missing? Why? Because she doesn't keep the commandments of God. Brothers and sisters, what do we call that? To talk about the love of God but not His law? Spiritualism. Spiritualism. Why is the second angel silent? Because she's not following the message. The people are not following God. They're practicing spiritualism. They're preaching the love of Jesus but not talking about His law. Are you with me? Is it clear in the Bible? I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. I just want to see if this makes sense. All right. This woman, this woman would seek to implant her own law showing she's the authority. What other power sought to attack God's law? He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and what? Laws. So here's the parallels between Revelation 17, 1 through 5, and Daniel 7, 25, the little horn. Revelation 17, 1 through 5, uh, Babylon gets judgment, it commits blasphemy, it removes God's law, and it persecutes God's people. Daniel 7.25, the little horn gets judgment, it commits blasphemy, it removes God's law, and it persecutes God's people. So God has given us clues as to who this impure woman is. What else is she called? Revelation 17.5, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. What are the abominations? It's what's in the golden cup or it's the false doctrines that she's intoxicating the world with. What are the false doctrines that she's intoxicating the world with? It's not the law of God because she doesn't represent the law of God. Are you guys with me? Okay, so she's the mother of false doctrine. Are you guys with me so far? All right. So what is, what do daughters do? Anybody here privileged to have girls like I am? Girls do something a little bit crazy. All right. I don't, it's probably not crazy to me. It's crazy, but you know, I'm not, I'm a guy. If my wife does something, my daughters want to do it. I don't know why, but they do. Not all the time, but there's like a large, a, a large portion of time, like a desire to do whatever mommy's doing, right? That's what daughters do. What mothers do, daughters do, right? How mothers dress, well, not always, not when they get teenagers. Anyways, notice this. My, my, my illustration's going to fall flat, so I'm going to move forward before it does. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So who is this great mother of all churches? Now remember, when, when we join Christ, when, 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 um, when, a, when a man, I'm sorry, when a man and a woman get married and they become one flesh, what does that represent? 
us joining Christ, right? The church being one flesh with Christ. So if it's an impure woman and she has daughters and they're becoming one flesh, what is going on here? The Cleveland Plain Dealer, 9-6-2000. A similar fundamentalist view position prevailed in June when the Vatican ordered bishops to avoid references to sister churches. And instead, remember that one holy Catholic and apostolic church is not sister, but what? Mother of all particular Christian churches. Now, this is a quote from Cardinal Joseph Ranzinger, later known as Pope Benedict, and this was in September 4 of 2000. The Faith of Millions, page 421. But since what? Saturday, not what? is not specified in the Bible. In other words, you can't find anywhere in the Bible where it justifies or declares to worship on Sunday, says to worship on Saturday. This cardinal or this, this father is going to tell us, but since Saturday and that Sunday is not specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? In other words, this father, this priest, he has a problem with these other Protestant denominations running around there saying sola scriptura. What does sola scriptura mean? It means the Bible and the Bible only, upon scripture alone. Very good. Someone speaks Latin in here. I learned it as the Bible and the Bible only, so I'm going to go back to that one, okay? But it does mean upon scripture alone. Anyways, sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible only, and this priest is saying, well, listen, isn't it funny, a bit curious, that you run around saying that you believe in the Bible and the Bible only, but you worship on Sunday and not Saturday. And what's more curious about that is you claim to be following the Bible and the Bible only, but the Bible doesn't talk about Sunday worship. It talks about worshiping on what day? Sabbath. Yes, I'm right here in case you're wondering. Yes, of course it is inconsistent, but this change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born, and by that time the custom was universally observed. They have continued the custom even though it rests upon the authority of what? And not upon an explicit text in the Bible. The observant remains a reminder of the mother church from which the non-Catholic sects broke away like a little boy running away from home, but in his pocket still carrying a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. It's pretty clear who this mother, this man-made religion is. Who is it? It's the Catholic Church. And why? Because they're not following God's law. They're following their law. The Catholic Church teaches that we follow the Bible and tradition. What did Jesus say about following the traditions of men? I'm just going to speak really simple here. He said, don't do it. Are you with me? This is the mother of all the daughters. The mother of all false doctrine is the Catholic Church. It is also clear who her daughters are, the other churches that have false doctrines that are like her. So, friends, what makes a church pure or impure? Jude 1 3. Beloved, while I was diligently, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the what? For the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. What were they supposed to contend earnestly over? The faith. The faith. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, 28 through 32. What were the apostles supposed to keep watch over? Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 32. The Bible says, because we are sola scriptura in this church, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, take heed therefore, take, I'm sorry, yeah, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. What are they overseers of? The flock. To feed the what? The church of God, 
what do you suppose you're supposed to feed the church of God with? The word of who? The word of God. So if I'm not teaching them from the word of God, then what am I doing? I'm certainly not doing my job, am I? Which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone day and night with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are what? Sanctified. When we give glory, we are be when we give glory to God, what are we doing? We are being sanctified. How do we give glory to God? By keeping his what? His law. Brothers and sisters, if we are not keeping the law of God, if we are not teaching the flock, if we are not teaching church members, if we are not teaching other people, other Christians, to keep God's law, are we doing what Paul is asking us to do? Let me rephrase that. If we're not doing that, are we doing what Jesus is asking us to do through Paul? No. And that means that we'd be getting people drunk off of the wine of our fornication. False doctrine. Paul said, he prophesied, that after I depart, grievous wolves are going to come in and they're going to try to lead away disciples after them. That's taken place. And that's why God sent the second angel to say, hey, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Babylon, confusion, which is a cause from what? Rebellion against God has fallen, is fallen. My truth is going to get out there. Now I'm going to pause for just a second one more time, and I know I'm running out of time. Who, I'm sorry, let me back up just a second. What is the message that delivers people out of the confusion that they find themselves in? It's the three angels' message. Are you guys with me? Those are the messages that are preached that get people out of the confusion that they find themselves in. Now let's go just one step further. Who has this message? We do. How important is it that we tell our message? I'm sorry. How important is it that we tell the message that God has given us to tell the world? Brothers and sisters, let's go one more step further because we're there. Jesus was getting ready to die on a cross, and he stood over Jerusalem, and what did he do? The Bible says he wept, the shortest English verse in the Bible. It says he wept. What was he weeping over? Jerusalem. And why was he weeping over Jerusalem? Because he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you like a hen gathers their chicks under his wings, but you wouldn't what? You wouldn't let me. I know that our message is not popular. I know that people don't really want to hear it because it's not pleasing to them. But brothers and sisters, they need to hear it. Do you agree? And who's going to tell them? We are going to be rejected like Jesus was. But he's asking us to tell the message. Let him worry about the results. Let him worry about the fruit. Let him do his job. He asks us to plant the seeds. Why? Because we are the only ones that have accepted his message that delivers the world from what? Confusion. Confusion. Now make sure you understand this. Make sure you understand this. Don't be confused about this next point I'm about to make. Don't be confused about this next point. What makes a church pure or impure 
is what they teach. What makes a church pure or impure is what they teach. It has nothing to do with whether they talk about Jesus or not. All Christian churches talk about Jesus. Spiritualism talks about Jesus now. What makes a church pure or impure is what they teach. Are they teaching what Jesus taught? Are they doing what Jesus did? Are they following what Jesus told them to follow? Are they walking with Jesus or just proclaiming to be? Now, dare I say this? If I was in the bar drinking a beer, preaching the same message, would you guys be listening to it? Why? Because I'm not following what Jesus did. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't care how minute a matter you and I think that it is. If it's in God's Word, it's important for us. He told us He would never do away with His law, that He came to fulfill His law and to give us an example. And He says that my saints at the end of time in Revelation 14, 12 will keep my commandments and have the faith of Jesus. They will have my faith. I'll empower them to keep my law. We can't get rid of God's law. We can't make our own law. He says, it's my law. You do it my way. Let me ask you a question. Did Cain and Abel both bring an offering to God? Did he accept both offerings? Why not? Because one of them brought his own works and not the works that God asked him to bring. We can't bring our own works to God. He says, I've already told you what works to bring. Do the ones that I'm asking you to do. That's what it means to have faith in Jesus. To do what he's asking us to do, to say, God, I'm not going to be able to do this. I already know that. I want to. My heart wants to do what you're asking me to do, but I have no power to keep your law. Please help me. And Jesus says, you got it. You got it. I'll tell you what, I know you can't do it, but I can. Why don't I just come live in you and work through you? And when we allow him to do that, guess what happens? We keep his law. We keep his law. John 7, 15 through 17. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is of God or whether I speak on my own authority. So you can see from the words of Jesus that doctrine and Jesus cannot be separated. They can't be separated. Revelation 18.4 And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins unless you receive her plagues. There is no compromise with this church. We must come out. There is no compromise with Jesus. We must give them all. There is no compromising the truth because there is no compromise in Jesus. He loves and sacrifices to the fullest. But no matter what we've done, Jesus can and promises to forgive us if we will but come to him. Years ago, when Jesus himself walked this earth, a woman was caught in the very act of adultery and drugged naked through the streets, being humiliated, unjustly so because they didn't bring the man she was in adultery with. Drugged to the feet of Jesus so that the Pharisees the leaders of the time, the religious leaders, could trip Jesus up as if you could trip God up and say, the law of Moses says to stone this woman. What do you say? And Jesus said, he was without sin. Cast the first stone. And then knowing their hearts, knowing that they would have the audacity to cast a stone even though they were great sinners started writing their sins in the sand 
for everybody to see. And one by one, they started walking away because they were in the presence of a holy God. And then Jesus looked down at that woman. And he said, where are your accusers? And she said, no man, my Lord. Was Jesus a man? And why did she say no man? Because when we come to Jesus, we don't find someone who accuses us. We find someone who defends us. We find someone who clears us. We find somebody who saves us. And Jesus picked her up. And he said, what? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Just like that woman, when we come to Jesus, we can be forgiven. And when we're forgiven, what is Jesus going to say to us? Go and sin no more. Who wants to come to Jesus tonight? Who wants Jesus to save them? And who wants to leave here under the power of Jesus, saying, I don't want to sin anymore. Father, you heard us. You saw, the, you saw the response in our hearts and our minds. We pray that you will send the Holy Spirit to seal those. That through your grace, through your favor, through your power, that we will go and sin no more, Father. But if we do, help us to remember that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, our righteousness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for this message, Father. We thank you for your law, your law, because when we fulfill the law, it fulfills love, Lord. And we ask that you'll help us to keep it and not do away with it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Is there any questions tonight?